Hi, this is a 30-minute presentation to help you learn more about genetic engineering of our food supply. If you live in California, you will be asked to vote on Proposition 37 in this fall's election. This proposed law would require labeling of foods if they're sold in retail stores. And that way, you would know if there are genetically modified ingredients in your food. So it's a good time to learn more about the whole process of genetic modification and why you might want to know what's in your food. Now, I'm human like you, and I have my own opinions and my own emotions about this issue. However, I think the best way to present it is to simply tell you the facts as best as I can, and that might make the presentation a bit dry, I know, but if you're like my previous audiences, you will insert plenty of your own emotional reactions to the things I'm about to tell you. And I don't need to insert my own. So I encourage you to have pen and paper ready and take notes because I'm going to be giving you a lot of information. Also, if you want to learn more than this presentation can teach, there are several films out, including Genetic Roulette, the newest one, and I believe that's on YouTube. But even this short presentation should hopefully provide you enough information that you can decide how to vote on Proposition 37. What are GMOs? GMO stands for Genetically Modified Organisms. They also use the term GE, or Genetically Engineered, and scientists use the term Transgenic. This means that a gene has been transferred, thus transgenic, from one organism to another. Now, genes are the tiny microscopic parts of the DNA that determine the traits of a plant, an animal, an insect, a bacteria, any living thing. But what they're doing is they're taking genes from one type of living thing, like a bacteria, and put it in a completely different type of living thing, like a plant. This is creating new forms of life that could never occur in nature. Do we need GMOs? Well, what the industry says is that genetically modified foods hold the promise for the future, that we could end world hunger by increasing the yield per acre of crops, make it easier for farmers, and... Uh, grow more food, basically. There was a study done recently by two genetic engineers who looked at the actual results from GM crops. And they concluded not only are the GM crops not doing what they said, but there's no need to take the risk of having GM crops in the first place because conventional plant breeding, which is known to be safe, and other natural approaches to increase crop yields can present the solutions that we need for our future food needs. The only result of GM crops that these engineers found in their studies that's consistent is a massively increased exposure to toxic chemicals. So why has genetic engineering failed to meet up to these lofty goals? Well, I'm sure the biotech scientists that are making GMOs are very smart. But here's the problem. Genetic engineering is an inherently unpredictable process. The picture that you see here is very misleading because you will never have a pair of tweezers small enough to pick up a gene or a piece of DNA. And therefore, scientists cannot see what they're doing and it's very much a shoot-from-the-hip, glow-in-the-dark kind of process that is very unpredictable and has led to thousands and thousands of experiments with failed results just to get one seed that does something that they want it to do. For example, they put a human gene in pigs, hoping that they would grow larger. And the pigs were so deformed they couldn't even stand up, and they had to be euthanized. Okay, now that's an obvious failure, but the, the real problem, or I should say the worst problem, is that there could be a failure that doesn't show up 
for generations, a very subtle problem that's created with this type of manipulation that doesn't show up at right away, but after the, the plant has been growing, or the animal, and then it reproduces, and then it reproduces again, suddenly you find out there's something really bizarre and wrong with this plant or this animal. So that's the reason why the FDA's own scientists warned that there could be unpredictable and dangerous results from genetically modified foods, and they said that they needed long-term studies. But the head of the FDA, who was a political appointee of the Bush administration, said, oh, I think we can trust the biotech industry. So what happens now is the biotech industry has voluntarily done their own testing in their own labs, and there's no long-term testing done. They only did 90-day feeding studies. They used poor science. And then they send a report to the FDA who sends them a letter back saying, it's the responsibility of the company making these to make sure that it's safe for farmers and consumers. So the FDA is not regulating it, and the companies making it are not responsible. And that's why the British Medical Association has said, let's stop planting GE foods. So let me make it very clear. The FDA, which is supposed to regulate our food supply and keep it safe, does not regulate or certify genetically modified foods. They never have. From the year 1992, their policy has remained the same. They state, the agency is not aware of any information showing that foods derived by these new methods differ from other foods in any meaningful or uniform way. In other words, they're saying they're just like traditional conventional foods. But this same industry has patented the seeds for these foods. Now, in order to get a patent, they must prove to the patent office that they are completely novel and unique with no prior art or precedent. So don't take my word for it. I looked it up in the thesaurus, and the thesaurus says novel and unique are the opposite in meaning of ordinary and conventional. So the FDA is saying there's no difference between genetically modified foods and ordinary conventional foods. And the patent office is saying you have a patent because these are not at all like ordinary or conventional foods. So GMO seeds are all patented. And therefore, I say they are unique and they should be thoroughly tested. So now we know that the FDA isn't doing anything, and the biotech industry companies are doing only 90-day feeding trials. Where are the long-term testing trials that we need? Well, those are happening on us. It's the huge American experiment. But with this experiment, there's no data collection. Even if there does turn out to be a problem, there's no way to track it, because these foods are not labeled, Nobody knows who's eating them and who isn't. And that's why a food scientist in Great Britain, Arpad Pushtai, said it's tremendously unfair to use the public as guinea pigs to test GM foods. What are the main crops that we are exposed to here in the United States? The main crops are corn. About 86% of the corn grown in the United States is GM. Soy, 93% is GM. Canola oil, 93%. Cotton oil and cotton used in fabric, 93% is GM. Sugar beets, 95% of the sugar beets grown are genetically modified. In Hawaii, they're making GM papayas. About half of the papayas coming here from Hawaii are GM. And we now have about 24,000 acres of zucchini and crookneck squash that's all genetically modified. That's about 13% of the supply of those vegetables. So where, where do you find this genetically modified food? Well, if you go to the grocery store and you buy meat, the meat has been fed with GM corn or GM soy or both, most likely, 
Uh, cornmeal is very heavily used in lat- Latino diets. Tofu is made from soy and corn oil. Those two foods are used heavily in Asian diets. Corn syrup is used as a sweetener in many, many foods and drinks. Alfalfa. Alfalfa is now going to be genetically modified as well. And that's going to be showing up through the dairy cattle in our milk, cream, butter, and meat, and vegetables. As I said, beets, zucchini, and crooknecked squash could be genetically modified with no label. About 50 countries representing 40% of the world's population already have laws requiring genetically engineered ingredients to be on food labels. Our country does not. The American Medical Association is considering resolutions calling for GE foods to be labeled and to have long-term studies done. The American Nurses Association has already passed such a resolution, and so has the American Public Health Association. They can see that without labeling, there can be no data collection as to the effects, whether positive or negative, on a large population over a long term. Disallowing this data collection is simply against the interests of science. The only interest it could serve that I can think of is to protect the producers and sellers of GMO foods from legal claims if it should turn out that these foods prove to be toxic or otherwise damaging in the long run. Some countries also ban GM foods outright or restrict their use, and those include Switzerland, Japan, New Zealand, Germany, Hungary, Austria, Greece, and Luxembourg. So what were the FDA's scientists so concerned about? Well, they mentioned three categories of risk. First of all, potential health risks. They said genetically modified foods could cause allergies, they could cause birth defects, sterility, and unknown consequences. They also mentioned the problem of loss of biodiversity if these genetically modified plants uh, destroy harmless insects and other species of plants, and a loss of natural species. If a genetically altered species gets out into nature and outcompetes the other species, causes it to go extinct, and then the genetically modified species, which is all identical genes, is vulnerable, and if some disease comes along, that species could be wiped out as well. First, we'll look at the health risks to humans of genetically engineered food. On September 19th, the Food and Chemical Toxicology Journal, it's a peer-reviewed science journal, published one of the very few long-term studies on genetically modified foods and their health effects. The authors were independent with no conflicts of interest. This study lasted two years in which rats were fed Roundup-tolerant GM corn Some of the rats were fed 11% in their diet, some 22%, and some 33%. Of course, there was a control group that was fed non-GMO corn. And there was another group where they were fed the GM corn and drank water with one part per billion Roundup pesticide, which is the amount considered safe for humans. The results showed a very significant rates of tumors in all the rats consuming the genetically modified corn, especially mammary tumors in females and kidney tumors in males. And as, besides that, there were marked kidney and liver damage and diseases resulting from these de- damaged organs. The study was led by a molecular biologist and endocrinologist named Gilles Eric Seralini of the University of Caen in France, and it was supported by the independent research organization, Crygen. And this is not the only such study. There was a Russian study where they fed hamsters for three generations with GM soy, and by the third generation, almost all of the hamsters were sterile, unable to reproduce. There was also an Austrian study feeding GM corn to rats, and they also noticed negative reproductive effects. After the death of thousands of cattle in India, 
It was discovered that glyphosate, which is the main ingredient in Roundup, kills beneficial gut microbes in the cattle. And these microbes protect the cattle from botulism poisoning. And so this led to botulism poisoning and death. The cattle that died were essential to both the economy and the culture of the small-scale farmers in India. So the GE crops are engineered in order to tolerate this herbicide Roundup, and so they've led to huge increases in the spraying of Roundup in India. And as a result, over a quarter million Indian farmers have committed suicide because they cannot make the GM crop work for them economically because they have to buy all this pe- the herbicide. And then they found out that their cattle died. And then they found out there were super weeds that had adapted to the herbicide. So it was a, it's been a huge tragedy in India. There is another study with glyphosate A report in Chemical Research Toxicology in 2010 states glyphosate and Roundup caused birth defects in frog and chicken embryos in doses far lower than those used in agricultural spraying. The study points out that humans have the same developmental mechanisms as frogs and chickens. Also, there was a study on sudden infant death syndrome in babies by the University of Sydney, And they found that 20% of these babies that died have detectable levels of botulinum toxin, suggesting a link with the glyphosate in Roundup. In 2002, two years after the large-scale introduction of genetically engineered Roundup-ready soybeans in Argentina, people began reporting birth defects after exposure to the glyphosate in the sprays during their pregnancy. In 2009, the Environmental Lawyers Association of Argentina initiated a lawsuit to ban the herbicide in that country. Recently, there's been a huge decline in bees around the world. While we cannot prove the link, there's starting to be epidemiological evidence linking the bee population decline with the use of herbicides and pesticides. And if Roundup can do this to frogs, it's not hard to imagine what it could do to bees. Without bees, we would not be able to grow fruit or nuts, since bees are the only insects who can effectively pollinate trees. What about allergies? Well, soon after genetically modified soy was introduced in the United Kingdom, soy allergies began skyrocketing. And York Laboratories did a study, and they found a link between the increase in GM soy imports and a 50% increase in the nation's soy allergies. Okay, now here's a different kind of GM crop. It's called BT corn. BT corn makes its own insecticide. It's made not only by the corn kernels, but the entire plant. BT is taken from a bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis. From that gene... With a lot of manipulation, they managed to force it into the DNA of the corn. So these plants have an insecticide in them. They're registered with the Environmental Protection Agency as a pesticide. Even though it's a corn plant, it's registered as a pesticide. And this corn is in your grocery store being sold. Now, the agricultural biotech industry says that Bt toxin is destroyed in the human digestive system, and therefore it's not at all a worry for humans. However, doctors at Sherbrooke University Hospital in Quebec found Bt toxin in the blood of 93% of the pregnant women there who were tested and in 80% of their baby's umbilical cord samples. They also decided to test just regular women, and they found two-thirds of them had Bt toxin in their blood. So this study has been accepted for publication in the peer-reviewed journal Reproductive Toxicology. So it's been recently determined that Bt toxin can also break down human cell walls. That's what it's designed to do in insects. The insect eats it, it breaks, it splits open their digestive system, and the insect dies. Well, animals and humans are now eating this Bt toxin, 
in the corn every day. The Council for Biotechnology Information has stated that the DNA contained in GE food, including the antibiotic-resistant gene, is broken down in the human gut during the digestive system, so it's not a, a concern. However, in 2002, the only human feeding study where they actually tested this theory showed that genes were transferred from the genetically modified food to the intestinal bacteria in the human gut. Now, if it turns out that this particular antibiotic-resistant gene that is put in some of the GM foods, if that gene transfers into human intestinal bacteria, guess what? Antibiotics won't work on that person. So next we're going to look at risk to other species of animals than humans and to other plants. In other words, risk to biodiversity. Papayas are currently the only engineered GE tree that's approved for market. The GM trees, which were supposed to be sterile, were not all sterile, and the GE contaminated the papaya trees nearby that were organically grown, and the, that, that crop of trees had to be cut down. About 230 notices of genetically engineered tree experiments have been filed with the United States Department of Agriculture since 1989. So they are planning to introduce many GM trees. They are supposed to be sterile, but about 5% of them are not sterile. And recently scientists have found out that the pollen from a tree can move up to 1,000 miles away in a single year and pollinate other trees, which means that the genetically modified pollen could invade thousands of acres of forests around it. There's a movie called A Silent Forest, which exposes the threats posed by the introduction of GM trees into our environment. Dr. David Suzuki, an award-winning scientist and environmentalist, warns of the dangers and the impact on native forests, indigenous people, and wildlife. Trees are home to many endangered insects, birds, reptiles, and mammals, which rely on them for food and shelter. Already there have been serious incidents of GMO contamination of natural forests and conventional crops. It's possible that a single experimental crop, even after being tested in the lab first, could wipe out an entire farm belt, a whole villages, and hundreds of species of animals. These are the potential risks that companies take when they sell experimental seeds to farmers. Dr. Suzuki explains that trees are being engineered for insecticide production with genes from the Bt bacterium. They're also being engineered for decreased lignin content, for fast growth, for growth in unfavorable soils, for sterility, and for tolerating the herbicide Roundup. Now, lignin content is being decreased in some of the GE trees in order to cut papermaking costs because lignin must be removed from the wood pulp in order to make paper. However, lignin gives trees their rigidity, and Karen Charman of the World Watch Institute says, studies have linked high lignin content with greater resistance to diseases and pests. This suggests that weakening this trait could make trees more vulnerable to these threats. What about our oceans and our fish? Well, the GM people want to invade our oceans with genetically engineered fish as well. Soon to be deregulated is a GE salmon, and scientists are concerned about the consequences of this. The data that's made public so far suggests that there may be safety concerns as well. Genetically engineered salmon, if approved for human consumption, would mean we're eating fish that have far less of the nutrients that salmon normally have, like the omega-3, omega-6 oils, some of the vitamins. In fact, some tests showed 65% less omega-3 and omega-6 than in wild salmon. But there's another danger, and that is the potential for food allergy. Salmon that are genetically engineered 
have elevated levels of IGF-1, which is a known carcinogen and a potential allergen. So here's the GE salmon that they're talking about. They call it the Aqua Advantage. Well, it grows 11 times faster than a wild salmon, and they reproduce in less than two years. Great! What happens if some of these salmons escape into the wild and they compete with wild salmon? According to the National Academy of Science, if that happens, it could lead to the extinction of wild salmon in less than 40 generations. Now, the biotech companies' own data show that 5% of the eggs of these GE salmon may not be sterile. That is a big concern. So, in summary, GMOs are labeled in about 50 countries. The FDA requires labeling of 3,000 ingredients in foods, but not GMO ingredients. GMOs could be toxic, they could cause allergies, and they could be less nutritious. GMOs create problems for farmers and for farming. They can disrupt ecosystems and reduce biodiversity. They do not necessarily increase yield potential of crops, and they cannot solve world hunger. What about Proposition 37? Well, I've read this proposition, and I can tell you it's clearly written, it's fairly simple and straightforward, and it's written by a citizen's group, the California Right to Know. It's not at all like the previous Proposition 65, which called for public buildings to label toxic ingredients, because Proposition 65 was written in a way to award hunter fees to attorneys and led to a lot of lawsuits. There's nothing in this law that should lead to large lawsuits because it's written to be very easy and inexpensive for companies to comply with. By simply adding a little more ink to the existing food labels, they can comply with this law. So the law simply states that consumers have a right to know what's in the food we buy, eat, and feed our children, just as we know how many calories are in the food we purchase or whether it comes from another country. A label on a food product in a grocery store would simply tell us whether our meat, our dairy, our fruits, or vegetables have been genetically altered in a laboratory. Shouldn't we be able to make informed choices and have the freedom to choose whether to buy genetically engineered food or not? So, Martin Luther King once said, Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Do you want to learn more about these issues? There are several documentaries out, one called The Future of Food, there's one called Bitter Seeds, and one called Genetic Roulette. You can find these at responsibletechnology.org. That's responsibletechnology.org. If you wish to get involved in the campaign to support Proposition 37, you can go to their website, which is CA Right to Know. That's C A R I G H T T O K N O W dot org. You can also write to your senator, uh, write to the editor of your newspaper, or call a radio station. Please. Share what you've learned today with others. Thank you.